Okay, please be seated. Uh, Mr. Frank, can you continue? Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Peterson, thank you. Um, we uh, wanted to ask you when you are putting together a training, when you complete a training, do you always uh, save in the department's records every record of that training, every piece of paper used for that training? Every piece of paper, no. And um, have you, uh, but does the department then uh, keep track of every training that is, has been attended? Yes. Now, I want to um, talk about those PowerPoints and these presentations that are made at the training. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to start um, with Exhibit uh, 388. Well, actually, before we start doing that, we had discussed a little bit about uh, the holster, correct? Yes. And I'm going to show you... What has been received into evidence as Exhibit 380. Uh, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, you will. And um, do you recognize what that is? I do. And we have received testimony that that is the taser uh, taken from uh, Ms. Potter after this incident. Uh, is that what you recognize it as, a, a, a Taser 7 holster? I'm sorry, did I say Taser? That that is the holster taken from Ms. Potter after this incident. It looks like a holster that we would have issued, yes. And is that the same as your holster that you currently are using? Similar. How is it different? This would, uh, as it sits on a belt, rock to the rear, rather than how I have mine, it would rock to the front. Okay. And what I'm wondering if you can do if your taser would fit into that holster. Okay. Um, and if you could demonstrate to the jury um, by placing your holster, your taser in that holster, and then demonstrating how it would be taken out of the holster to use. Do you want me to stay seated or stand up? Probably easier to stand up, I think. Okay. Well, first, tell us uh, you know, what, what you're doing as you're doing it, please. Okay. Uh, so there is a safety release button here, which merely takes a piece of plastic out from the trigger area allowing the taser to rock straight to the rear and then I 
it won't go any further than that. Now I can acquire a grip and I can just pull it out. And so once you let that switch go, how much do you have to move it to get it out of the house? Inch and a half. Okay. But you can't pull it straight out, you have to do move nope. a little. All right, thank you. All right, may I approach again? Sure. And um, what I've done, this is a rather lengthy PowerPoint, correct? Yes. And I'm going to jump, just jump from slide to slide um, so that we can kind of speed this along, all right? And when you talk about a PowerPoint, I assume everybody knows this is sort of a presentation that you put up on a screen for everybody to see, correct? Yes. And uh, you could also print it and provide it in paper as well? Yes. So this one uh, is from 2016. This was in the records of the 2016 training records, and that's consistent with the date on the first slide here, true? Yes. Right. Now, when I go to slide two, And this indicates uh, what the goal is, correct? Yes. And that's to reasonably safely and effectively operate the taser, correct? Yes. And if we go to slide four, here again is a um, instruction that every participant, participant must receive, fully read, and understand the taser warnings, correct? Correct. I know you mentioned earlier a release. Um, does every student have to sign a release? Yes. Okay. I, I thought it was only the people that subjected themselves to a voluntary uh, exposure. That was the warnings that I was speaking about, but on these um, form that we use to track that training, they're also signing a release to hold TASER liable for any injuries they occur, or that occurs while they're being trained in TASER. Got it. Um, but this here again is another uh, slide about the warnings being provided to the participants, correct? Correct. And if we can go to slide four. Sorry, I was already there. That is slide four. Can we go to slide eight, please? And uh, this uh, slide talks about disclaimers. Each agency is responsible for creating its own use of force policy, correct? Correct. And so this is why uh, you go over the policy, the Brooklyn Center policy? Yes. And um, at the bottom, uh, CEWs are not are serious weapons and are to be treated as such, correct? Correct. Is that stressed to um, participants? Yes. And a taser is not a substitute for deadly force. What does that mean? That if you need to use deadly force, you should probably use a instrument that would um, meet the needs of deadly force. Because a taser alone would not necessarily be deadly force. Not necessarily. Can cause death, but not intended. Certainly can. And then to slide 10, A uh, person must complete the entire curriculum, correct? Correct. And that's uh, been true for all the TASER trainings you've been involved in? As far as I'm aware. Okay. Slide 12. Directing everybody to make sure that the safety switch is off, correct? Yes. And slide 13. Lasers must not be pointed at the eyes, so we know at least as far back as 2016, the tasers you had had safety switches and lasers, correct? Yes. Slide 14. Here again is a now familiar screen about uh, warnings for the taser, correct? Yes. And here you are to distribute, review, and understand, at least a reminder to do that, the taser product warnings, correct? Correct. Slide 15. And again, uh, making the uh, materials or giving them to uh, those who attend the training, correct? Correct. This is also a, a part of 
All the taser trainings that you're familiar with? Yes. All right, slide 24, please. So voluntary exposure. Uh, I think you mentioned that earlier. It's when somebody agrees to be shocked with a taser, correct? Correct. Have you ever volunteered for that? I have. Um, how many times have you volunteered for that? Once. Why only once? Didn't want to feel it again. Okay. Um, and so that's a voluntary exposure, correct? Correct. And um, that's not required as part of the training? No. When it does happen, um, and if we could go to uh, slide 29, voluntary exposures require two spotters, is that right? Yes. Why is that? It's to reduce the risk of injury when the person falls. And if we can go to slide 41. This is a, an illustration of the Taser X26P. Is that the model you were using in 2016? Yes. And that's why you would have this particular PowerPoint, because that's the one you were using? Correct. And that uh, also as well had a flashlight and a laser, correct? Correct. And slide 42, please. Indicates that model had a safety switch and a CID screen, the information display at the back also. Yes. Slide 44. This slide indicates similar way to operate the safety switch as the current model, correct? Correct. In slide 49. That's that CID screen, very similar to the one that you have on you today, correct? Similar. And slide 61. And this screen uh, is about a spark or function test, correct? Correct. So is that a requirement uh, for uh, people operating a taser even back in 2016 for this, when this presentation occurred? Not a requirement. How do you mean? It says should be conducted. All right. Um, so it was a re it was a recommendation from Taser. Correct. And your policy would have required it in 2016. It mirrored it, saying it should be conducted. Slide 87. This is an instruction on using minimum force necessary to accomplish objectives. Correct. Yes. And only those actively resisting, right? Yes. Also, the uh, training here to give a verbal warning before the use, correct? Correct. And then the next slide, 88. Uh, again, giving subjects an opportunity to comply before force is used. That's part of the part of the warning as you indicated earlier. Yes. Slide 89. And this is uh, the targeting guidelines, correct? Yes. Um, and the targeting guidelines in 2016, in the same areas of the body as we went over previously? I'm not sure. Okay, fair enough. Slide 91. So the smart use considerations, um, can you describe what what those are? What aspect of the training these refer to? My question is really more about this sort of this portion of the training that they refer to as smart use considerations, this more tactical or practical. Yeah, it's taking the totality of the circumstances of the situation in front of them, whether it's in a reality-based training scenario or out on the street, and making appropriate decisions. Okay. And if we can go to slide 98. So again, to reduce cardiac risk, is there a, a concern about the heart when a taser is deployed? There is. 
And what is that? There have been instances where it's been reported that the taser has caused cardiac uh, failure in people. Uh, according to the research I've seen, it's inconclusive. But just to be sure, we want to try and keep electricity away from the heart to minimize that if possible. And um, so this is uh, part of the concept of targeting, correct? Correct. All right. And slide 108, please. And uh, this is a slide about the pros and cons of which side you carry your taser in the holster? Correct. Similar to the one we looked at previously? Yes. So this was presented during the 2016 class as well? I can't say for sure. Why not? I don't know what version of the PowerPoint this is. If this is the user course, if this is an annual research course. So this is uh, from your training records. So it would be one that you had. But we correct. could have hired new officers and they could have gone through the initial course. We would have done a recertification or annual research for officers. So I can't say specifically when this was presented. But certainly this is part of the training on which side to holster. For this PowerPoint. Okay. A concept that was certainly known to uh, officers in 2016, whether it's this taser presentation or not, correct? Yes. Okay. And that by that I mean weapons confusion. Yes. In slide 114, please. So again, uh, this is about targeting, right? Yes. So that was uh, a concept that was taught as far back as 2016, correct? Yes. And 116. And here again, seeing the same sort of target area, back is preferred, correct? Yes. When practical, practicable, I guess is the word, correct? Correct. And 117. If the front is targeted, it should be the lower abdomen, correct? Correct. And there is a um, reference here to split the belt line. What does that mean? It references how the body is made up of two different nerve bundles, one that controls the upper body, one that controls the lower body. Uh, the two different hemispheres, which is kind of at the belt line is where you can engage both of those. So even if you are at a close distance, if you can get probe spread above the belt line and below the belt line, you are more likely to have neuromuscular incapacitation. When the probes come out of the taser, uh, do they come out at different angles or different yeah, angles from the taser itself? Yes. Why is that? To give spread between the two different probes. So the farther you are away from some from the subject, the more spread you'll get? Correct. And so you want to be a certain distance away from the subject to get the best probe spread. Is that proper, the proper way of saying that? Best probe spread, among other things, yes. Slide 119, please. And that's what's uh, explained here, correct? <clears throat> yes. And slide 120. This is the uh, explanation of neuromuscular incapacitation, correct? Yes. And slide 131. Some causes of limited effectiveness. So this was a topic of training at least whether this one or, or other trainings as, as far back as 2016 at least, correct? Yes. And, and loose or thick clothing could be one of the circumstances that affect effectiveness? Yes. Okay. Slide 150, please. Uh, again, a recognition back in 2016 that, that uh, the taser may not achieve the intended results, correct? Correct. And slide 155, please. So back then, the recommendation was 
um, the preferred range is 7 to 15 feet, correct? Correct. And is that still essentially true? A little bit farther off with the current Taser product that we carry. Okay. And what do you mean a little farther off? Generally, we want to be between 10 and 12 feet. And slide 168. Um, now, this indicates you can go hands-on with the subject. Uh, what does that mean? It's recommended that we try and restrain the person that is being tased during the tasing to reduce the need to administer additional rounds or cycles of the taser or other force options becoming necessary. And uh, can a person who goes hands-on receive some of the electro electrical shock from the taser? Yes. How does that happen? Electricity travels the path of least resistance. So if, you're, if you put your hands in that path? It will go into your body. Okay. Slide 205, please. This uh, refers to non-firing drills. Uh, you were training back in 2016. What, what is this referring to, non-firing drills? This would refer to being able to put a cartridge onto the taser, take the cartridge back off, that you can man manipulate the safety, um, perform so, a spark test. So the proficiency things you were talking about earlier? Yes. And then at um, 206, please. Firing drills, would those have been done uh, as well in this training in 2016? Yes. And 207, please. Uh, refers to conclusion and written examinations. Were written examinations done throughout some of these taser trainings? In some taser trainings, they were, yes. Okay. And that's not done anymore, is that correct? Not currently, no. Okay. So at this time, I would move for the admission of Exhibit 258. Examination should be 258. Yes. <clears throat> what is 258, Mr. Frank? It's a uh, lesson plan from Taser Training. Uh, no objection as to admissibility uh, redundancy is the objection. Though. All right. The, um, the exhibit will be admitted into evidence, and you may publish it. All right, do you see this then, Exhibit 258, on the stand? Yes. And what is that? It is a lesson plan uh, that was developed by one of our TASER instructors. And so is that the sort of lesson plan for the actual TASER training? Yes, it's the outline of what we would uh, want to accomplish and do that day. Okay. And we see in the Roman numerals there, um, the TASER presentation, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, Number two is department policy and legal review, correct? Yes. And so that's the sort of classroom, part of the classroom section of it? Yes. And then the TASER presentation, is that referring to the PowerPoint? Yes. And then the written test, correct? Yes. And deployment of TASER? Yes. So this is a fairly standard format of the TASER trainings while you've been doing them with Brooklyn Center? Over the years, yes, the standard format. Okay. And uh, deployment of the taser, how is that done uh, in those types of classes? Uh, we have a static target that is placed at an optimal distance, either standing or in a laying down position. Um, depending on the instructors that we have there, we may have one instructor, one run line, another instructor running a different line, and then we cycle officers through as they perform the um, put in a cartridge on, how to operate the safety, how to do a spark test, and then how to deploy a taser. This time, I would move for the admission of Exhibit 263. It's a 
taser training outline from 2018. Any objection to 216? No Two. objection, redundancy. All right. The objection is overruled. 216 will be admitted. And for the record, it's 263. Oh, 263. Yep. Thank you. Put that on the screen for us, please. Do you recognize that? Yes. And uh, this is uh, essentially an outline for the taser refresher in 2018, correct? Correct. And uh, this is a sort of standard format outline for the trainings during this stretch of years? Depending on what the topic was, yes. Okay. What do you mean depending? Well, they also list here chemical aerosols, um, in intermediate weapons. So they may have also gone over some of those things at this training. I was not one of the instructors there, so I can't say for certain. Okay. Are you familiar with the instructors listed, though? I am. Okay. And um, so this would be the annual research on the taser, correct? It appears so. And then I would offer, Your Honor, Exhibit 264. Any objection to 264? Okay. 264 will be admitted into evidence. And uh, does this appear to be the um, taser training PowerPoint from the 2018 uh, presentation? It appears that way. Okay. And uh, let's go to the next page, please. Up in the upper right, the expectations. Uh, again, repeating the expectations of safely handling uh, the taser, correct? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, this is the, it's got to certify annually, correct? Yes. All right. And then in the lower right corner of that page, again, we have that warning about tasers, correct? Yes. And um, that moment to remind you to distribute the warnings, correct? Yes. Right. Then we can go to the next page. Uh, little uh, lesson on electricity here apparently, right? Correct. And then an explanation, the slide about neuromuscular incapacitation, correct? Yes. All right. Then let's go to the um, next page. Slides in the bottom, again, voluntary exposure guidelines, correct? Yes. And uh, again, requiring a spotter, correct? Yes. All right, then let's go to uh, the next page, and then the next page, please. Go one more. And uh, screens at the top, the version uh, in 2018, the X26P, correct? Yes. Is uh, the same safety switch, flashlight, and laser, correct? Yes. And the CID screen? Yes. And then if you could skip to page 8 in the bottom corner. Uh, the same slide here about the spark or function test, correct? Yes. And then if you could uh, skip to page 14, please. Here are those same smart use considerations about the amount of force to use, correct? Yes. And then if you would go to page 17, please. Here we have the holster pros and cons uh, screen again, correct? Yep. So another topic are taught again, as well as probe placement and targeting, correct? Yes. And then let's go to the next page, please. In the lower right corner, again, deployment distance considerations, correct? Yes. In the zero to seven feet uh, one, correct? Yes. I can go to page 20, please. And uh, 
Again, instruction on limited effectiveness, correct? Yes. If you can go to page 21, please. Again, contingencies uh, may not achieve the intended results, correct? Correct. But also, again, the warning about people operating vehicles or machineries in the lower left. Correct? Yes. test uh, there as well, correct? Yeah, right? And that would be at least gone over in class, correct? Depending on the year, correct. That's how it was taught uh, in 2018, correct? Can I ask how what was taught? I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. How what was taught? Those, all those subjects were taught again in TASER training in 2018. According to that presentation, whoever received that presentation, that's what they learned, yes. And... Yeah, I would offer Exhibit 243. Any objection to 243? 243 will be admitted. And if you could pull that up, please. Do you recognize what this is? I do. And is this a, a, a taser PowerPoint uh, for essentially 2020? Yes. Okay. And um, at the risk of dragging everybody through a whole other PowerPoint, would you agree that this contains a lot of the same subject matter as the 2018 PowerPoint? For the most part, this appears as though it's a user update, which may have cut out some of the basic information about uh, electricity and um, the background function of how a taser works. And so, well, let me just do this. Uh, if you can go to page 9713, be the next page. Again, um, to provide the warnings, targeting, smart use considerations, correct? Correct. And uh, 9714, please. Again, uh, review the PowerPoint, uh, the product warnings, pass the test, deploy cartridges, correct? Pass the functional test, yes. Okay. And uh, page 9715, please. And again here, stop in the middle. At least this is telling you stop and make sure that these have been distributed for individual students, correct? Correct. So if we can go to uh, 9718, please. Again, targeting, right? Don't, don't, uh, well, avoid the head, throat, breast, chest area of the heart, correct? Don't intentionally target those areas, correct. And 9719. Again, the back is preferred, correct? Correct. And below the neck? Yes.
And can you go to page 9732 as well? So this is referred to as a smart use study aid, correct? Correct. And so this would be provided uh, to students as well through the PowerPoint? Either through the PowerPoint electronically or in uh, physical form. Now, um, and this was um, the 2020 version, correct? That looked like it was version 22, I believe. Okay. From 2020. I think that was the date on the front of it. Right. The, the version number doesn't always correspond with the year. Correct. Um, so 2020, we all know, was the COVID year. Did that affect how you did the TASER uh, update training that year? Slightly, yes. How so? Uh, we had to go to a venue where we tried to conduct as much of the training outside as possible uh, to limit inside time. We did not use electronic means, uh, therefore we printed everything off on paper. And gave that to the, each student? Correct. Now after 2020, did the uh, department change to a different uh, taser? We did. And it changed I assume, to the taser 7, correct? Correct. And so was there a requirement, uh, first of all, that People who are the officers who are carrying a taser be certified or recertified in 2020. They were recertified in 2020. On the previous model. Correct. And then also be trained or certified on the new model, the taser 7. Yes. And how is that done with them? Taser creates a transition training, a PowerPoint test. Uh, some drills that we have to do to familiarize the officer, the end user, with how the Taser 7 differs from whatever product they were on before that. So it's a introduction to the new device. Correct. And at this time, I would offer Exhibit 244. 244 will be admitted. Did uh, this and do you recognize this as that uh, PowerPoint from the transition course? Yes. And um, did it go through um, sort of the new parts of the Taser 7 that we talked about earlier, the, the lasers, the, and the safety of switch wasn't new, of course, but... Yeah, it went over the differences between the Taser 7 and the product that we were on prior to that. And... Um, at the end of it, it talks about uh, drills and practical exercises. Do you recall that? I believe so. Yeah. Did you do that for that? Yes. Transition course? I did. Can, and did you, in fact, teach that transition course? I did. And can you explain for the jurors how you did that, the, the drills and practical exercises? So after we spent several hours in a classroom setting, uh, they, the users had a Taser 7 in their hands. We, they were able to learn how it's different from the X26P that we were on. Once I was uh, confident that they had a good understanding of how it worked, I went into a different area of our police department. I had set up a training scenario. Uh, each officer came in one by one. I had a safety officer that was there running the scenarios, but I had created the scenarios. I was the subject that they were going to be working against, or I was the subject that they were going to uh, have to use some type of force against. I had two different scenarios for each officer. Um, when they were done with their scenario, we asked them to not discuss it with any other officers, to just try and give the other officers the best opportunity for training. And we went through the two scenarios. And as part of those scenarios, were they required to um, draw their tasers and deploy them? Yes. And uh, how do they deploy them without hurting somebody or getting another voluntary exposure? So one of the uh, features of a taser 7 that we did not have on our previous platform is they have a training 
probe that is basically some Velcro that comes out and it's connected to monofilament line that still runs back to the taser. So no electrical current ever flows down to the subject that has those two little Velcro probes that uh, connect onto them, but they still get the feel and the sound of what a Taser 7 would uh, sound like if deployed. And, um, okay, you can take that down. I'd like to show you exhibit 246, please. Do you recognize what that is? I do. And uh, do you see a, a signature down there towards the bottom? I do. And whose signature is that? Mine. And there above your signature are some check marks. Uh, did you place those there? I did. And what is the purpose of those check marks? To show the officer was able to show their proficiency and confidence in using the Taser 7. And that was done through the classroom instruction as well as the scenarios, the drills? Correct. Right. And uh, that is why you placed your signature there, correct? Yes. And uh, the student's signature above that is Miss Potter, correct? It appears so, yes. And this was done on March 2nd of 2021? Yes. All right, I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk to you about non-specific taser, you know, training not specific to taser, just regular use of force training, the rest of the, of the training. All right. Um, Your Honor, I would offer Exhibit 364 at this time. Exhibit 364. 364 will be admitted into evidence. And uh, do you recognize this document? Yes. And um, explain, if you will, where this document comes from. This document is prepared by the Minnesota Post Board who um, oversees and tracks training that officers must get every year or through uh, continuing education, education credits over their career. And are there certain topics that are required as part of, or required by post for officer training? So this document is specific to in-service, meaning officers who are currently licensed and on the street uh, for use of force learning objectives. And there are many components of this document. And I'm glad you mentioned that because we see the term in-service quite a lot. What does that mean in regards to training? There's a couple different definitions, but it generally means that an officer has passed their field training and are certified for solo patrol and are a licensed uh, peace officer authorized to make arrests in the state of Minnesota. So in-service training to distinguish it from like new officer training? Pre-service training is what we would call that. All right. And um, the topics listed on Exhibit 364 are those specific topics required by post, correct? Yes. And this document is dated February of 2012, uh, is that right? It appears so, yes. Yeah. And so this is something post has been putting out for quite a while. Quite a long time. Okay. Um, and we see that, you know, A is use of force, right? And so what is generally, you know, topic A, use of force about? It's pretty general, talking about the statutes that um, are in Minnesota that define what and when we can use force as police officers, but also the public. Other statutes, uh, 6932 and 33 about uh, warrants and using the minimum amount of force necessary. Uh, and then the tactics that are listed there, verbal skills, empty hand techniques, intermediate weapons, deadly force, and how to use the tally of the circumstances to make appropriate decisions. So this is a lot of, uh, I guess, classroom stuff, right? It is, and a lot of this stuff is covered in other aspects of this, this document as well. Okay. I'd like to go on to the next page then. And topic B, 
uh, another topic required by post, correct? Yes. And what is B? So it's giving the officers information that they may need or have during, uh, before, during, and after a critical incident or use of force incident. So this is referred to as readiness aspects of force, correct? Yes. And under the performance objectives, the number one there is uh, how stressful, extremely stressful situations affect physical and mental functioning, correct? Yes. So has this been a topic of use of force training as long as you have been a trainer? Yes. And is this required uh, a required part of training every year? Annually. And how does the department, uh, or how has it tried to fulfill that requirement? Over the years, we try and educate uh, the instructors on it by doing research. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about how any of these things will affect any specific officer, but there are general guidelines that have been reported from other officers who have been in stress stressful situations and things to note of officers uh, as they prepare for a stressful situation or the aftermath of. And so is this a way to try and teach them to think and act in real life situations? It's a way to prepare them to not know how they're going to react in that situation to prepare as best as they can for it. And uh, is this done through the scenario-based training with your department? Partly, but partly through lecture as well. Okay. And um, if we scroll down uh, to letter D, Proficiency with intermediate force weapons. Uh, would this cover taser training? Yes. That's considered an intermediate force weapon? Yes. And so is this required uh, as part of annual training? Yes. And, um, and letter E, principles of firearm use. That's something taught every year? Yes. And that's uh, both classroom and um, practical? Mostly range time. So if we talk about qualifying for the firearm, what does that mean to you as a, as a police officer and a trainer? Showing profici proficiency with the firearm that they're assigned or a, a patrol rifle. Can you just describe for the jurors generally how that's done? Uh, we're on a range, static target, um, we have a course of fire, and the post board says what uh, certain percentages of our rounds have to be at different ranges and we have them shoot that range and they have to have a certain qualification score. And how often is that done then? Annually. Okay. You were talking earlier about the scenario based training officers having all their weapons, is that a, an attempt to incorporate you know, all of these topics into training? Yes. And um, for the admission of exhibits 316 and 317. Any objection? Okay. No objection. 316 and 317 will be admitted into evidence. I'm going to kind of show them in reverse order with 317 first. And do you recognize what this form is? Yes. And what is it? This is an affidavit of attendance for a training session that anybody in the state of Minnesota can use for a course that has been approved by the Minnesota Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. Okay. And um, if we scroll down to the second page, do you see a, a spot here for Officer Potter's signature? I do. And down on 31 there, correct? Yes. 
And what date did she attend that? It says November 15th, 2016. And, and does it indicate how long? The class that day was um, approved for eight hours or eight credits. All right. And if we can scroll back up, I'm sorry. Um, what is the sort of the title attached to this training? This one looks like it is a 2016 Brooklyn Center PD in service. And so in service could cover a number of topics? Yes. And so if we can go then to Exhibit 316, and do you see this um, explained there as well? Well, let me ask you this. Is this the outline from the November 15th in-service? Yes. And so we see that in the afternoon there was a couple of hours on use of force policies and statutes? Yes. Taught by you? Yes. Okay. And, um, and so that's kind of how in services are done, various topics, including sometimes use of force. Yes. And um, I want to go to offer exhibit 325. Objection. That exhibit will be admitted into evidence. I'm going to ask you if you recognize um, uh, this. Uh, well, no, that's the wrong number. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. All right. Let's take that one down. Exhibit 271. And 272. We might as well do that. Okay. 271 and 272 will be admitted. And let's start with 271. So this is uh, the uh, outline, I guess, if you will, of the November 15th, 2016 uh, in-service, correct? This looks like a lesson plan, correct. Right. And this will cover... Um, de-escalation, correct? Yes. Um, as well as uh, the use of force policies and TASER, correct? Correct. So this is sort of a typical layout of, of classes, various topics, uh, including here, TASER? They vary from year to year. Yep. And 272, please. From that same training, discussing the readiness aspects use of force in 2016, correct? Yes. Now I then would offer uh, exhibit 318 and 321. Any objection? To 318 and 321. No, you're not. Those will be admitted. All right, let's look at uh, 321, please. Here again, a sign-in sheet, correct? Yes. And if we can uh, scroll down, uh, you see Officer Potter had signed in for this as well? Yes. All right. On nine five of 17? Yes. All right, if we can scroll back up, uh, this is for uh, what kind of class? Uh, it says it's a fall 2017 use of force. And then if we can go to exhibit 318, And uh, so this is uh, the fall use of, for use of force in service, the objectives, learning objective A is the use of force, objective B is the readiness aspects, correct? Yes. And objective D, the taser, this was all taught uh, in that class, for instance? The classroom portions of taser probably would not have been taught in this. Okay. What uh, would have been taught with, with, with reference to the taser? And so that would have been the scenario part of it. Okay. Same with chemical, uh, intermediate weapons. So in here you can see under timeline there's five hours spent on scenarios. So we still cover parts of other learning objectives, 
but we may not go through the classroom portion of it. So in this situation then, of this day, uh, five hours was spent doing those scenarios? Yes. And Your Honor, I move for the admission of Exhibit 323. 323 will be admitted. And do you recognize that? Yes. So this is a 2018 use of force, correct? Yes. And uh, I think we will need to scroll down to uh, see Officer Potter's signature there, correct? Yes. And the 326. Uh, 18? Yes. All right. And then I would offer, uh, Your Honor, Exhibit 265. Objections to 265. Let me just a second. Your Honor. 265 will be admitted. And this is the outline for that uh, same class that Officer Potter had signed into we just looked at. It appears so, yes. And uh, indicating that this use of force would include scenario-based training as well. Not this one. It does not appear so, no. Why not? I'm sorry. Uh, this looks like it's just uh, rest control or defensive tactics, as some call it. Um, two hours is pretty tight to cover that category and have scenarios built into it. Okay. Okay. Um, And uh, exhibit, if I could, Your Honor, offer 266. That'll be admitted. And this for the uh, use of force in service later that year, correct? Yes. And would this include uh, scenario based training as well? Yes. All right. And so this was done in 2018 as well. Yes. Um, to move uh, sort of quickly along, um, in exhibits 327 and 330, Your Honor. Any objection to those exhibits? No. They'll be amended. And um, if we could put up exhibit 330. And this is a sign in for the low light and clement weather training, correct? Correct. And uh, if we scroll down, Officer Potter signed in to that on 1026. It appears so, yes. And if we can go to 327. Again, an instructional block here, correct? Yes. But uh, scenario based training would have been done. At some point with this? Yes. And uh, Your Honor, if I could offer Exhibit 259. Any objections to 259? 259 will be admitted. I'll put that up. Um, so here again is the October 2020 in service, is that correct? Yes. And that includes uh, A, the use of uh, force, correct? Yes. And if we can scroll, um, well, and we don't have to, at the bottom B, the readiness aspects of force? Yes. Taught in the fall of 2020? Yes. So, kind of, I've tried to just get a flavor of how those years have gone, where you'll have a couple of trainings each year for use of force, the aspects that POST requires? Yes. And would would that would each of those include scenario-based training or not always? As much as possible we try and include it, but it's limited by time we're given, resources we have, but as much as possible I try and incorporate them. And I'm going to show you now what has previously been admitted as Exhibit 335. Do you recognize what that is? I know the format. Okay. 
uh, a record of um, training. Training. You'll see over in the name of training um, column. Do you know who enters that information? The what column? The name of training column. That would mostly come from any affidavit of attendance that was filled out for a approved class or an external training that the officer attended, which was not in our control. And so this is just a real brief description of what the actual class was. Correct. Your Honor, can I just have a moment, please? Yes. Just one final question, uh, Sergeant Peterson, in, in all the uh, years that you've been working at the Brooklyn Center Police Department, um, have you been aware of any other officers who have drawn their handgun when they meant to draw their taser? I don't. And in the scenario-based training, has that ever happened? It's not a topic that I frequently think about. I would have to take a considerable amount of time to, to think about that. Yeah, I guess I'm just asking if somebody has ever said to you that's not what I meant to do. I have conducted so many trainings, run so many trainings that they honestly all blur together. I couldn't pick out a specific time. I have nothing further for the witness here. Yes. All right, members of the jury, we're going to stop for the day, and we're going to start up again at 9 o'clock. Have a wonderful evening. You may step down. <laughs>